Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you all for joining us for another one of our CEO speaker series. Um, I'm Steve Blank. I'm the principal gift officer for the California Rangeland Trust, and I will serve as the MC and moderator tonight. Uh, we've got a really great turnout, and I'm excited to get started. It's 5.30 on the dot, so uh, we're going to go ahead and move forward. Um, the CEO Speaker Series is our opportunity to, to, to keep in touch with our friends and uh, hopefully to provide you some entertainment and interesting discussion. Uh, we're extremely grateful to our Legacy Council co-chair, Jessica Schley, for hosting tonight's event, and to Nicolette Hahn Neiman for agreeing to being our featured speaker. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, first, since we are doing this virtually and we aren't able to see one another in person, we'd love to know who's joined us. So in lieu of introductions, we'd love for you to go to the chat box at the bottom of the screen and type in your name. We'd love to say hi and see who's in the room with us, so to speak. Um, secondly, tonight is meant to be interactive. We want your questions. Um, you can click on the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and type in any questions you might have. And at the end of Nicolette's presentation, we'll have a Q&A session and we'll try to get to all of the questions if we can. Um, but you should feel free to type them in the Q&A box as they come to you so they don't slip your mind. Uh, and then we'll track them at the end when we, when we get to the Q&A. And, &A. and uh, finally, I hope everybody has an adult beverage and a snack in front of them. Um, normally, we created this whole CEO speaker series during the pandemic, and normally we would do these in, 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 in somebody's living room, we'd all be sitting in comfy chairs, and this is meant to be fun and casual, so um, get a drink, sit back, relax, and let's have a really good time for the next hour and a half. Um, and that's all I got. I know you guys didn't come to hear me speak, so at this point I'll kick off the CEO speaker series by introducing the CEO of the California Rangeland Trust, Michael Delbar. Michael, take it away. Thank you, Steve, and welcome everybody. I know we have some board members and legacy council members attending. So I would like to recognize and thank them for their efforts on our behalf. We also have some landowner partners in the room who have made the decision to voluntarily conserve their working rangelands. So thank you for helping to preserve the working lands and natural resources upon which we all rely. We also have some new faces joining us tonight, and so we're grateful you are here as well. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you that are donors to the Rangeland Trust. Our work depends on support from friends like you, and your gifts give us a tremendous impact on our success. The CEO Speaker Series was designed to connect with our supporters at a statewide level. As we emerge from the pandemic, we have spent this year focusing on connecting at the local level. We've held a few wonderful regional events, one in Sacramento, one in the Santa Inez Valley, and we have other ones planned for later this year. We also held a terrific landowner appreciation dinner in conjunction with the California Cattlemen's Association's mid-year meeting in June. Although we're the largest California land trust, we want you to think of us as your local land trust because the work we're doing really is in your backyard and the people we're helping, they're your neighbors. Hopefully we'll have a chance to see you all in person real soon. Tonight, we're very happy to have Nicolette Hahn Neiman. The mission of the California Rangeland Trust is closely aligned with her message. At the end of the day, our organization exists to defend beef as well. Nicolette will tell you that cows provide great benefit to the world, but without ranches, there are no cows. So our work to conserve private working ranches through landscape conservation and mitigation for development is the foundation for her premise. And we have the data to prove it. As you know, we conducted a study with UC Berkeley that looked at 306,000 acres of our nearly 365,000 acres that we have under conservation. The results were pretty impressive. Those acres we have conserved provide 1.44 billion with a B dollars annually and ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are, include clean air, clean water, wildlife habitat, and the preservation of our state's open spaces, and of course, the production of food and fiber. In addition, the study found that for every dollar invested in our work, 
we provide a return on that investment of nearly $3.50. That's a 350% return on investment. I don't know about you, but I'd love to get a 350% return on my investments, especially in this market. So Nicolette's book, Defending Beef, provides reliable science on the importance of working rangelands. She has carefully supported her arguments with unassailable data. Several of our non-ranching staff members in reading this book remarked on how much they learned and now feel much more confident in talking about the global issues surrounding beef. This includes staff that have been here for over five years. Being able to see our work in California set in a global context is so valuable. So thank you, Nicolette, for your hard work and diligence in compiling the data for this book. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our hostess for tonight, the co-chair of our Legacy Council, Jessica Schley. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for being here tonight. I'm so excited about um, the talk tonight. Um, my name is Jessica Schley. I am a former rancher um, from a former ranching family. Um, and I have been a fan, a huge fan of the future changing habitat conserving California Rangeland Trust since I found out they existed um, in around 2000, uh, the year 2000, two years after uh, they hit the ground running with their amazing mission. Um, uh, the Rangeland Trust is actually the largest land trust in the state out of more than 150 state and local land trusts. Uh, combined, all of these land trusts uh, have over two and a half million acres um, held under easement, um, which is a huge deal. And of that, 365,000 um, acres are held by the California Rangeland Trust, which makes 15% of the combined total. We're the largest land trust in the state. Um, a little bit about Nicolette. Um, I first discovered Nicolette um, in her book, her first book, The Righteous Pork Chop in 2009. Um, it was when I was studying my undergrad at UC Berkeley and at the time a uh, uh, declared philosophy major. Um, it was through her book that I realized uh, that, the, that UC Berkeley <laughs> um, has a College of Natural Resources and a rangeland ecology department. Um, and it, <laughs> it changed my life because it, uh, uh, helped me realize that I could actually get a degree in something that I was truly madly deeply um, passionate about and that there were people out there um, doing amazing work um, uh, like Nicolette. So that was super exciting. Um, I reached out to her on Facebook and we became Facebook friends and I've been sort of a, a follower, a fan, a stalker <laughs> ever since. Um, and I was super excited when she published um, Defending Beef in 2014. Um, that was the first edition. She's now um, just recently published the second edition of, the, of Defending Beef. Um, and uh, it's actually been uh, translated to, I think, at least a dozen languages. So Nicolette can clarify on that, uh, maybe more. Um, and so it's just been a really exciting thing to be able to uh, have connected Rangeland Trust with Nicolette, um, because like Michael said, there's just so much in common and um, she's been just a fabulous defender of beef and of all the hard work that we all do on the Rangeland every day. So with, uh, without further ado, I'm so excited to introduce Nicolette. I guess I should mention um, thank you to all the Legacy Council members um, that are here tonight as well. All right, take care. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all tonight and um, appreciate the kind introduction. And whenever um, an author hears a book change someone's life, it's extremely gratifying. So <laughs> so nice to hear that. Thank you for saying that. And um, as we were talking about before we went live, um, I'm coming to you tonight from my kitchen, which is super appropriate because um, so much of what, you know, we, we tend to talk about these issues in kind of compartments and we talk about rangelands, we talk about um, water pollution or air pollution, we talk about maybe nutrition or health, um, but really it's all totally connected and it's all about food, how it's produced, what we eat, how we're eating, you know, how we view food, how we value food how we um, understand the systems that bring us the food and how we do or don't value them. And I think so much of what is 
happening these days with the food system and, and diet and health are all connected to our sort of collective disconnection to the land and to just nature and how it works. And I think the fact that um, fewer than 17% of Americans live in rural areas and of that only a small percentage are actually directly involved in agriculture is kind of so much the core of where we get so many of the modern health problems. Um, I truly believe that having lived, I've lived in a lot of large cities. I lived in um, a big city in France for a year. I lived in Dakar, Senegal for a year. I lived in uh, New York City for five years. And so I am well acquainted with urban life and I understand and appreciate a lot of the benefits to it. But I know for certain when I was living in large urban areas, I found myself very disconnected from the natural world. And in fact, in the time that I lived in New York City, um, I ha absolutely had to live near Central Park because I had to go and be in a green space for part of every day or else I found myself going crazy. So I don't quite know how you know the collective um, industrialized and non-industrialized world in the urban areas are managing um, to be so disconnected from nature, but I think rediscovering our connectedness to the land is a key part of fixing what ails us, so many of the problems that ail us um, related to health and environment. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is there's there's a huge amount, um, I don't think it was mentioned in the introduction, but I was a biology major in college and then um, went to law school and practiced law for 10 years. And the last um, two years that I was actively practicing law, I was working specifically for an environmental organization where I was entirely focused on livestock related pollution. And it was really about the pollution from the concentrated, mostly the hog industry, but also the poultry industry and to some extent the dairy industry. But it was during those years that I became convinced that the discussion around um, pollution and agriculture was also um, quite wrongheaded and um, that so much of the criticism being lodged towards meat and dairy and everything else and eggs, uh, that production was um, um, suggesting to people that they should stop eating meat and that um, and or you know even consuming milk or anything and that that was really um, not the right solution and that more and more as I um, began to visit farms and ranches and spend a lot of time reading reports and speaking with people about this that um, I became more and more convinced that animal agriculture is absolutely essential for um, ecological health and for human health, but that there's um, a lot of improvement that needs to happen in the way it's being done around the world and in the United States. So what I want to um, talk about tonight is a little bit about, um, I, I want to kind of give a, a bigger picture view um, after and I've been working on this stuff now for about 22 years, I believe. And um, for the last uh, 19 years, I've been living on a ranch here in Marin County. Um, I married through through my work at Waterkeeper Alliance as an environmental lawyer. I met Bill Nyman and became um, I married in, as they say, the oldest way to get into the profession is to marry into it. And that's what I did. <laughs> so I went from being an environmental attorney um, to being directly involved in a ranch originally just living on a ranch and then then get more and more more involved in the ranch daily and then for seven years i worked pretty much full time on the ranch as i was writing my first book so i've been working in in a lot of different capacities in this whole question of um, food production and especially livestock production and um, animal agriculture and what i want to do is share some of my thoughts from the last couple of decades of um, sort of the bigger picture of where we are and what a lot of the misperceptions are and then where we can um, w go from here and why why animals are actually so important um, to human health and to ecological health. So I'm gonna try to share the screen. I'm not sure if you're gonna see just the slides or if you're gonna see me and the slides. I'm not sure how that's gonna be set up, but I'm gonna try to um, share a presentation that I've put together. And um, uh, looks like it's not on my desktop anymore. Just a moment, please. I will find it here. 
And there it is. Okay. Now. Okay, is that working now? Yes, okay, good. <laughs> We had a little technical problem at the, in the practice session, but it looks like we got it. Okay, so I'm calling this the real food solution, why animals matter, because um, there's just so much discussion about the problems around animal agriculture. And I actually believe that both from a human health perspective and ecological perspective, the animals are absolutely essential. And I think for California, it's particularly important because such a large portion of the American West and specifically California is rangeland and is open land. And it's really land that is meant to be grazed. And it would have been grazed by animals in prehistoric times. In fact, probably huge numbers of animals. And um, if we don't have domesticated animals in the modern situation, these lands, as we all know, will um, change and no longer be open space and the whole entire ecology that is built around open spaces will suffer so um i think everyone on this um call tonight probably is quite aware already of the value and importance of grazing animals and uh, but i want to um flesh it out a little bit you know why why are animals so important and what are some of the current arguments being made against that and then what are the responses as i see it okay so the, from the from my perspective, again, having worked on this for the last 20 years in a number of different capacities, there are a lot of problems with the way modern industrialized agriculture is taking place. And the world over, we see a lot of huge open um, plowed fields that are singular monocultural production. It's very segmented and disconnected from other parts of any kind of um, agriculture. And it is um, it tends to focus on whether it's a plant crop or an animal crop um, on a fast growing variety or breed. Often it's something that's genetically modified. And um, I want to clarify and emphasize that I am not totally opposed to genetic, genetic modification, but it's important to note that that is a characteristic of um, modern agriculture. And it is very chemical and fossil fuel dependent. To a large extent, animal agriculture is also um, dependent on a lot of inhumane practices, things like keeping um, sows continually in crates and um, keeping egg laying hens in battery cages. As we know, California has taken um, action on based on ballot initiatives against those specific practices. But those are still the widespread uh, methods of um, modern agriculture in the world for animals and the overall approach of this kind of agriculture is really to diminish life it um it focuses on um elimination of um whatever plant we think is a weed you know whatever fungus we think is undesirable whatever insect we think is is a pest and um to quote gabe brown you know as he always says when he used to be in uh a farmer from North Dakota, I assume you all know who he is already, but just in case any of you don't, um, probably the most famous farmer in the world right now. <laughs> but he says, uh, you know, he used to lie in his bed in the morning and think, what am I going to kill today? You know, what insect am I going to kill? What what um, weed am I going to kill? And then as he began to shift towards regenerative agriculture, his shift of mindset was to focus on the life and to um, foster and to um, notice and appreciate and try to um, further catalyze more life on his farm in North Dakota. So, but the conventional agricultural approach is really to focus on having a single output and to try to um, stomp out basically any other um, any other live thing that's happening in that space. And overall, this system is really quite wasteful and polluting, and it's basically an extractive system. It's one that doesn't focus on the regeneration of the land, the soils, the wildlife, and um, also, you know, just the overall um, ecosystem. I I put this picture in here because this to me is, this is, of course, a, a painting by Grandma Moses who, as many of you I'm sure know, lived to be um, 
over 100 years old and um, didn't start painting until she was 78 years old. And a lot of her paintings were um, things that she remembered from her um, earlier life. But what I like so much about this painting of farm life um, you know, probably from the mid to late 19th century, is that um, is it shows a lot of human activity and a lot of diversity of activity. And there's all kinds of different things happening here. And there's a whole community here of people, not that this is necessarily a realistic scene, but I think it suggests this whole idea that agriculture in this country until you know fairly recent decades would have been something that was fairly complex and had a lot of different things going on and a lot of different types of people involved to doing things together um and then this is to me a kind of a, a picture of so much more of what the conventional and modern industrial agriculture looks like where you have huge and this is an actual photograph this is not a not a drawing um you have you know it's very monocultural very large scale and very machine dependent and chemical dependent um so could not be more different than you know the grandma moses scene and this is um a picture of a battery um hen operation in georgia where there are hundreds of thousands of hens laying eggs that are continually kept in cages and this is a sow operation where these are these are sows that are created continually um, during their pregnancy and usually even after they give birth. So this is what a lot of um, I think is causing the negativity towards animal agriculture and animal based foods that there's what is, is so pre prevalent nowadays. And it's also, I think, um, contributing to the whole problem we have with the modern industrial diet. And that's really um, one that is based again on um, breeds and varieties of animals and plants that are rapid growing, um, that are um, built, I mean, especially in the case of um, plants that are designed to have long shelf life. But as a result of this, of this type of breeding, um, these are foods that tend to lack flavor and have lower levels of nutrition. There's been a lot of research on this and showing how the basic nutritional level of pretty much every food that's produced in the United States has dropped dramatically over the last several decades. And the, because of the farming methods um, that I've just been showing, these problems are aggravated because you have a much longer ch um, chain of um, supply chain between the producer and the consumer. And so foods tend to be um, consumed after they've been transported a long distance, stored a long distance, and they're altered in many different ways. And they're basically primarily turned into processed foods. That's what people are mostly eating in the United States today. Things that are high in sugar, industrial oils, and highly caloric, but are biologically very inert, and you could even say they're biologically dead. So basically, we're living in the United States largely on processed food, unappetizing, and non-nourishing food. And this is this is very obviously directed to, connected to um, the modern health problems that are so prevalent in the industrialized world now. Now, this is to go, so I'm using these paintings to kind of show, um, you know, what things look like not that long ago in human history. This is a painting actually from a, a Flemish um, painter from, again, sort of late 19th century and just showing, you know, a meal. And if you look at this, it's you just get, first of all, it's just beautiful to the eye. Um, and I'm not, again, not suggesting this is a necessarily a typical meal, but it might not you know, be unusual to see a table like this at that time period. And you basically see really nourishing foods. You know, you see butter, you see fruit, you see vegetables, you see fish, meat, and um, and and some bread. And it's just really simple, delicious food. And it's not that different from how, you know, most people that would have had capacity to have enough money to buy good food would have been eaten, eating not that long ago. But this is... <laughs> unfortunately, much more what um, the modern diet in the United States and industrialized world looks like today. And this is food that is um, extremely high in sugar, um, extremely processed. And, you know, even the French fries are something that are basically, um, you know, very high in carbohydrate, much lower in, you know, um, nutrition of all different kinds of things, including high quality protein, but also just all of the um, vitamins and minerals that we need in food. I love potatoes, so I have nothing against potatoes. 
But if we're going to eat potatoes, you know, French fries are not the healthiest way to get them. And we now know there was a, a report that just came out in 2021 in the Journal of American Medical Association saying that Americans between the ages of two and 19 now get 67% of their calories from ultra processed foods. So the kind of foods that I just showed in that last picture. And if this doesn't startle you, then I don't know what will, because this is probably the most worrisome um, in fact, I've seen in a long, long time, in many years, um, about where our human health is going. Um, you know, we already have massive problems in the current adult population, but if you are reared on these foods from infancy, you are absolutely guaranteed to have a lot of health problems in your life. So to me, um, you know, kind of my, my own summary of where so much of this is all, you know, wh what's happening in all this is that we're currently subsidizing, not just in the United States, but in much of the industrialized world, we are subsidizing industrial methods, which lead to overproduction and underemployment, because of course, most of these things are um, low uh, in terms of labor and very high in terms of mechanization and other kinds of inputs. And this leads to cheap food. This is basically the cheap food policy that we have had for decades in this country. And this is clearly contributing to people not really valuing food, overeating a lot of calorie, but with very low nutrition involved. And then it leads to a lot of waste, waste of food and waste throughout the production system and ultimately a lot of pollution. So we know there are many things wrong with the dominant model. So there are um, quite a growing number of voices that are saying, well, clearly we need to just get rid of the animals in the food system. This is where I come in. This is my, my big focus. So as someone who was a vegetarian for over three decades and who was an environmental lawyer focusing on animal agriculture, you know, do I buy this? Do I believe that we need to get rid of the animals in the food system? And the, my answer is very emphatic, no, not at all. And the reason is starting with just, it's just based on a basic misunderstanding. Um, there's um, a really um, popular you know, notion that cattle, for example, are equivalent to cars in terms of um, global warming. In fact, there's a lot of suggestion that they're worse even. And, um, and for a lot of reasons, I go through it in a lot of detail in my book, that this is just a totally false equivalence. Um, cattle, for so many reasons, are um, essential to ecosystem functions, whereas, um, uh, cars are simply human built machines that have inputs and outputs and the output side of it is causing a lot of um, ecological problems, including contributing to climate change. Um, and so there's just no no real equivalence between these two things. And and what I like to say is that, you know, as H.L. Mencken said, for every complex problem there is, which, you know, and I would in this case be focusing on the problems of our food system, our agricultural system, our human health in the industrialized world, we have a complex problem, clearly. And so many people say there is an answer that is clear and simple, but it is wrong. <laughs> and in this case, I'm focusing on a specific idea that we should just get rid of the animals, because to me, the more I've studied this, the more I've learned, the more I've worked on a ranch and visited a lot of other farms and ranches, the more I see that idea as dead wrong. So what do I think are the real solutions to the problems that we're facing? We really need to work on creating dynamic, complex, and resilient systems and specifically the focus being regenerative farming and ranching, which is all about this idea of mimicking and connecting with nature, focusing on soil biology and fostering life. As I mentioned, you know, the quote when I was talking about what Gabe Brown said at the beginning. And that ultimately when we do that, we're gonna be producing real whole nutrient rich foods, which are going, going to fully support vibrant human health over the long term. You know, I think one thing that's happened in the United States these days is when you reach a certain age, um, you begin to be told by, you know, your doctor or whomever, whatever, whatever healthcare um, you're getting, that you are of the age now where you should begin to be taking a variety of medications. You know, you should be taking a blood pressure medicine, you should be taking a statin, you should be taking, you know, whatever else. And by the time you're, you know, 60, you're probably taking two or three daily medications. Well, my belief is that that is... Um, that is actually a ramification of the way we are living today and the way we are eating today. And that that is not the normal 
that we should not accept that as the norm or accept that as the normal way of things. That if we're healthy and we have a healthy diet and lifestyle, that's not really something we should be expecting to go down that pathway. Um, so when we produce good food and when we do it the right way, and then we eat that food instead of eating processed foods, um, we can have vibrant human health over the long term. Not that we won't have any health problems, but a lot of what is ailing us today is based on that processed food. Um, and so the question comes then, what do we really need animals in order to build these regenerative systems that produce healthier food? And my answer is yes. So why? Okay. It starts first with this notion, um, Fritjof Capra, I'm sure many of you are familiar with him. He lives in California and has written um, a number of books about systems thinking. And I heard him speak in Berkeley a few years ago. And I realized as I was listening to him that he was saying exactly what Defending Beef was saying. It was literally the exact same message. He said, um, in nature, everything is connected. Only humans make linear machines. And he was talking about um, food systems and ecosystem health and saying that we needed to think about the connections between everything and understand the connectedness and make our um, approaches to agriculture um, be built on this notion of having healthy systems and understanding these systems. So just a few examples for those of us that are directly involved in, you know, agriculture, you know, um, ranching or farming. Um, we obviously, we all know the water cycle is one of these systems that we, um, you know, there's um, so many different elements to it and it has so much influence and effect on what we do and what we are doing is having so much effect on that. Similarly, the nutrient cycle obviously has been spoken about um, for decades is very important in terms of, you know, the, um, the, not just the, um, the nutrients that are contained in the soil and the things that are growing um, based on that, but also how, um, how the things that are dying are re-entering that system and breaking down and, um, and then being utilized by whatever is growing. And most importantly, I like this slide in particular, this idea of a soil food web being another one of these systems that you have um, not just um, animals and of all different shapes and sizes, but especially the microscopic um, organisms, including fungi, that are absolutely essential for the health of the entire system. How, how much um, you know, vegetative growth occurs in any given area, and not just that, but the diversity of that vegetation. In Defending Beef, I actually quote a study that um, was done um, by a combined group of European and Chinese researchers where they uh, opined that the most important factor in the ecosystem diversity, in any ecosystem, will be how much biodiversity is occurring at the microscopic level in the soil, that that will have the single greatest effect in terms of the overall ecosystem's biodiversity. So when you think about it that way, then you start to realize how important it is to focus and understand this biological component of the soils. You know, there's been talk for decades. In fact, I've met quite a few people um, in the farming and ranching community that said they went to college studying agriculture and they were told all the time about um, potassium, nitrogen, phosphorus, maybe even calcium, et cetera, you know, sort of the chemical and maybe the physical properties of soil, but that they never talked about this question, which is actually probably the single most important thing, which is the biological side of the soil web. And so in, in my books, I spend a lot of time discussing this and explaining, you know, and, I, and personally, to be honest, I didn't know that much about it myself. You know, even though I was a biology major in college and then was an environmental lawyer, it wasn't until I started writing my books that I started really researching these questions and learned a lot more about it and shared this um, in my books and began to understand this as the key component to healthy regenerative agriculture and food system and, and healthy um, food because it is the biological health of the soil that will determine how healthy the food is that's being produced. So I want to say specifically a few words now about the greenhouse gases that are related to livestock, because this has gotten so much attention. And I think, I think 
it's fair to assume that most of the people on this call are supportive of the rearing of livestock, the raising of livestock for food. But there may be a concern or an ambivalence that you might feel about, well, okay, um, I'm hearing so much. It's, I believe in eating beef. You know, I believe in the importance of having people raising cattle, but maybe now there's so much problem with climate change that we need to, you know, rethink this or whatever. I mean, I've, I've actually had that conversation with quite a few people. So here's what I've learned. Um, first of all, the, the, the whole um, problem of quantifying how much livestock is actually contributing greenhouse gases is far more complex than people generally realize. And the global reports that have been done on this have been, a, you know, basically attempt to do this. And there was one um, in 2006, which was called Livestock's Long Shadow. And that report um, quantified the total contribution of livestock um, to the, the climate change issue as being about 18%, that about 18% of global warming gases were coming from livestock. And I, I actually wrote um, a response specifically to that report that was um, published as an essay in the New York Times. And um, and then it actually kind of triggered the writing of the whole first Defending Beef book because um, it really got me thinking about the need to specifically respond to this growing argument, this growing idea that climate change is basically being dramatically um, amplified by the raising of livestock. And the more that I've dug into it over the last decade, the more I've realized that it's a not only is it an oversimplification, but it's really wrong. Um, so first thing is that the, the more current figure is the um, the, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the um, of the United Nations updated that 18 percent figure to 14.5 percent a few years later. And that's a more current figure. But even that figure is probably way too high because it really has a lot of problems. For one thing, it does not include anything at all for the mitigation that we know, we all know is happening where you have good grazing systems. So even the report itself, the Food and Agriculture Organization of 2013, contains a statement that said grassland carbon sequestration could significantly offset emissions. So the report acknowledged this, but did not include it in the number at all because they didn't know the number was. So they felt that, okay, we don't know what it is, but so we can't quantify it. So we're just going to leave that 14.5 figure there. Truthfully, that um, that's a very important acknowledgement because what it says is that the figure could be, you know, half of that or a third of that or a quarter of that because they hadn't quantified how much it was being offset by the carbon sequestration. And then it's also important to note that in the U.S., all domesticated ruminants are only about two to three percent of all greenhouse gases. That's the official figure from the um, Environmental Protection Agency and the United Nations. So there's often this, um, again, this sort of comparison with, you know, planes and cars and cattle. And um, there's even been, you know, that ridiculous movie Cowspiracy made the claim that um, that cattle were a greater percentage than transportation. That's just wildly wrong. Um, this has, you know, been very carefully studied by, you know, a million <laughs> scientists around the world. And it's um, it's been it, there's a lot of debate about the numbers and how to calculate them and, and what to what to use and what to not include, et cetera. But it is widely accepted that in the in the industrialized world, the percentage is very small that is actually contributed by the livestock because it's the transportation sector is so much greater of of a um, source of carbon emissions. And in the US, it's about two to 3% of all greenhouse gases. So that's the actual number. So when you talk about these figures that are global, they're not really applicable when you talk specifically about the US. If you did, and so a kind of a, a parallel study to that, to those that um, EPA uh, analysis about the GHGs, the greenhouse gases, is a study that was produced um, in 2017 um, about um, in the proceeding of National Academy, Academy of Sciences, which said that if you eliminated all farm animals, you would only reduce. So this is eliminating all farm animals, um, you know, the hens and the pigs and the cattle and everybody. You would only get a reduction of about 2.6 percent of U.S. greenhouse gases. So that shows that it's a, it would be a very small return. But you would create, and the report also said this, um, a dramatic deficit 
nutritionally for the people of this country and elsewhere. So let's drill down for just a little bit for I want to go a little further on this topic and talk about methane specifically, because that again gets so much of the attention. So um you know, with all of these issues, there's, you know, some truth to what's being said. And certainly methane is produced by cattle production. You know, we all know this. And we also know that, um, you know, methane is um, a concern as far as what it's doing to the atmosphere and its contribution to global warming or, you know, climate change. Um, but um, again, this has been dramatically misportrayed in sort of mainstream media and in a lot of places that want to advocate against animals in agriculture. And so I just want to make a few key points about methane. One is that um, Penn State University um, did an analysis showing that the amount of methane that's produced by the ruminants that are in the United States today is probably no greater than what the ruminants of the United States were producing um, prior to settlement by Europeans in in um, in North America. So this is not necessarily, um, you know, a be all end all a point here because, you know, just because we once had similar methane levels from wild ruminants doesn't mean that we shouldn't be concerned about domesticated ruminants. But I think it's important just to keep it in perspective. Um, secondly, um, and I think this one is a really important point. There's more and more research now showing that um, we've blamed cattle basically for a lot of stuff that was caused by other things. And one of the things that is um, increasingly being shown to be um, a, an actual cause of the methane increases we've seen globally is really fracking. And um, doc, Dr. Robert Howarth, um, who heads the methane project at Cornell University has done a lot of research on this, looking very specifically at the methane that is being produced in North America and around the world, but especially in, in the US. And he, um, he has shown through very specific analysis of the DNA print footprints, you know, of these various molecules that are um, showing up in different parts of the U.S., um, that a lot of stuff that was once blamed on cattle is actually due to fracking. So these sort of methane clouds that are being seen in different places and blamed on cattle, and they cannot be actually connected to cattle, he says. Um, not that he says cattle produce no methane, but he believes that a lot of what was, you know, you know, erroneously blamed on cattle is actually due to fracking. Okay, now this is even perhaps more important, and that is um, this next point is that there's been a lot of underreported methane from the natural gas, coal, and oil industry around the world and in the U.S. And I'm really thankful for the fact that for the last year there have been a whole bunch of articles and reports that have been coming out around the world. Um, and this is largely due to satellite technology getting better and the ability to, um, you know, track methane. The, the Washington Post did a huge um, series of articles about methane plumes coming out of Russia, for example, um, none of which was reported. And in fact, Russia simply denied that it was happening. <laughs> Not that surprisingly. And a lot of other places do the same thing. And um, and it was very clearly shown in, you know, by satellite um, imagery that there were these huge methane plumes coming up. But even more importantly, um, the, the entire um, energy sector world, the world over, has not been required to report or track these emissions, even in places like Europe. And so there's now a, a greater understanding that the um, a much larger share of the global methane is coming from these leaks, and in many cases, even um, intentional um, leakages or you know um, releases, I should say, of methane from the natural gas, coal, coal and oil industry. And this stuff has been being blamed on cattle. Um, so this is really important that this is now being revealed that it's actually much more the fossil fuel industry than was previously understood. And finally, there's this misaccounting problem. Um, I happen to have the opportunity to meet Dr. Miles Allen and hear him speak in England a few years ago. It was just before the pandemic. It was in 2019. And he's done a lot of read, writing about this. He's a professor at Oxford University. And for um, several years, he was on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change as well in the Scientific Advisory Committees specifically focused on methane. So he's one of the world's leading experts on methane accounting. And he says that the current conventional method for accounting for methane emissions is all wrong. Now I go through a lot of detail in the book about why this is, but he basically says, 
you know, as I was sort of saying um, a few moments ago, that um, cattle do play a role in the world's methane, but it's a much smaller role than is, you know, currently believed by the mainstream public and policymakers. And that um, if you really understand methane and how it works in the atmosphere, um, it is very clear that um, cattle is, uh, it's really um, silly to focus on cattle and that it's much more important to focus on the emissions from the fossil fuel industry. Part of this is because of um, the next point, which is by a quote from Dr. Frank Mitloner, who many of you I'm sure are familiar with, who's at UC Davis and it goes by the Twitter handle GHG Guru, at, because he does a lot of work related to um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and does a lot of writing and speaking about it. And he basically, he has a series of videos. In fact, I would urge you to look them up if you haven't seen them um, about how basically the, the carbon, you know, and methane is obviously largely a carbon molecule. Um, so he's referring to carbon dioxide and methane when he says carbon. Um, this is not new carbon, he says, when you have, when you're talking about the emissions coming from cattle, it is recycled carbon. It's basically old carbon that has been cycling through the atmosphere and through the natural ecosystem for eons. And the difference is when you're um, doing natural gas and coal um, and oil exploration and bringing that that up to the surface, you are literally bringing up um, carbon that was safely tucked away in the you know interior of the earth and you're bringing it out and then it, much of it is getting into the atmosphere. So it's a very different question. And again, we've kind of been comparing apples and oranges and getting things confused in the mainstream conversation about methane. So I think that's a very important point as well. And finally, and this is kind of um, a point I haven't heard um, very much discussion about, but again, this is someone I met in England um, who's been doing some writing and speaking about this, Dr. Michael Lee, who's a professor of sustainability of livestock systems at, at Bristol University in the UK also. And he's he's making a very interesting argument about the importance of understanding um, greenhouse gas emissions from the perspective of nutritional value that each of those, um, you know, that can be associated with each molecule of those emissions. And what he argues is that our current greenhouse gas food impact research is all done on kilograms, but it should be done by nutritional value. Now, the reason that's so important is because beef and other meat is incredibly nourishing. And so if you, and you know, not just in terms of protein, but in terms of a lot of really important nutrients, micronutrients and macronutrients. And so if you fail to consider the value of the food from a nutritional standpoint that you're talking about when you talk about greenhouse gases, it's kind of um, nonsensical, as he points out, because you need to think about what is the value to, to the human food system for each of these um, you know, items of food that's being produced in order to figure out, you know, basically, is it worth it? Is what we're doing here in terms of, you know, whatever transportation emissions, whatever kinds of emissions anywhere in the food system, um, we need to think about, you know, everybody knows it's kind of infamous that, you know, strawberries are and raspberries are flown across, you know, around the world and so forth. Those are the kinds of foods that probably are much more arguably much more problematic from the perspective of its nutritional value compared to its emissions. And beef, on the other hand, and lamb and other, um, especially all the red meats, um, have a very high nutritional value. And so whatever um, greenhouse gas emissions are um, caused by it actually um, need to be balanced against that and considered against that. So I think that's a really important point. So um, I know I keep talking about methane, but I, the reason I'm doing it is because there's so much discussion about it and people get really hung up on it. So I just want to say a few more words. Um, so one thing about methane, again, that people are not that aware of a lot of times is that soil microorganisms, and I was talking before about the importance of them in the soil, have, a, have a, a, an important um, role in how much methane is released. So we know that there are things in, in the soil, meth, methanotropes or methane oxidizing bacteria, MOBs, which actually consume methane. 
And termites have been shown, termites are like little tiny cattle, just like um, cattle, which, which consume highly um, cellulosic material of low nutritional value to just about anybody else. Um, and they can make it into food and they can turn it into meat and milk basically because of all of the microorganisms that inhabit their, you know, their miraculous digestive systems. And um, termites are kind of similar. They're like little tiny cattle. They cannot actually consume wood, but they can live off of wood because their guts are occupied by, inhabited by, um, you know, billions of tiny microorganisms that break down the wood, that cellulosic material, and turn it into nourishment for the termite. And the reason I'm bringing up the termites is because there's been some research that has shown that um, even though uh, there's a methane release coming from the termites when they break down the wood through this um, microorganism activity, just like with cattle, but the actual impact of a total termite mound is probably zero as far as methane emissions because they've been found, these termite mounds and the soils around it have been found to be so highly occupied by methane oxidizing bacteria that it actually um, consumes all of the methane that the termites um, produce. And so this is a very interesting line of research suggesting that cattle that a significant portion of the methane coming from cattle could be broken down by, um, especially in well-managed grazing systems. So some of the people that are researching this around the world are Dr. Mark Adams at Sydney University in Australia and Dr. Ed Bork at University of Alberta in Canada. Another type of mitigation that's getting a lot of attention these days, I'm sure you're all aware of this, is um, seaweed. And um, there are some people right here in Marin County, and I know various places in California where, where you know, operations are trying um, some addition of seaweed to the feed, and it's been shown to be as much as a 99% um, offset in the, in the methane releases coming from cattle. Now, I'm not convinced seaweed is, you know, the miracle answer to methane, but I think it's maybe one piece of the puzzle, you know, maybe some methane um, emissions could be offset with some addition of seaweed in certain situations. Um, the, the rice industry, um, I skipped that point, but I meant to mention them. The rice industry was, um, in the 1980s, was one of the leading um, uh, human-caused um, sources of methane in the world and did a um, pretty dramatic self-examination because of the methane that was being produced and um, has been you know, by some estimates, shown to dramatically have reduced their um, their methane emissions simply by changing their practices. So they allow um, evaporation of the water off of the vegetation where they're growing the rice, and that has been shown to reduce the methane. Um, you know, not necessarily everybody's doing that all over the world, but a lot of places have, have done that. And so um, I just mention it as an example to show that um, industries can change their practices to reduce methane emissions. It's not an intractable problem, in other words. Dung beetles are also have been shown um, to reduce methane. So the higher your dung beetle population, the less methane you have on your operation in general. And so, um, you know, uh, the more we can foster the existence of dung beetles on our ranches, the better. And even some interesting lines of research like um, room, metal weights in the rumen have been shown to reduce methane emissions. So these are just some interesting lines of research that are happening around the world on methane emissions. Once again, I do not consider it an intractable problem. And there's um, a greater and greater focus on um, farming for soil carbon. Um, some really good examples in other parts of the world, such as Uruguay and France. And there's also a pretty good focus on this in California. And there's been some good legislation trying to incentivize this. So as I, as I said a couple of times, I do not consider the methane problem an intractable problem, although you know we've been told this over and over again. So I wanted to just arm each of you with a few points that you can mention to people people in conversations when they ask you about methane. <laughs> now, let's step back again a little bit and look at the bigger picture. What are the unique advantages of animals versus crop production? One of the most important points, and this is especially important in many parts of the world, is that you don't have to own the land in order to raise livestock. And especially in the developing world, a huge portion of the people raising um, livestock don't own any land at all. They just have um, a herd or a flock and they will bring that around to different places and maybe bring it back to a small space at night or they'll just be continually, um, people that are nomadic are continually moving with those animals. 
And so the fact that you don't have to even own land is really important. And similarly, it's portable. So if you are in a part of the world where there's political instability or you know dramatic changes in the climate or flooding or fire or drought, whatever, you can actually move with your animals. This is not something you can do with crops, obviously. And similarly, you have a flexible harvest. You don't have to, you know, we all know you put a seed in the ground. Um, there's a certain amount of time it takes to grow. There's a certain amount of time it takes for the um, plant to be ready to harvest. And then it has to be harvested at that moment. Um, animals are really different. Um, they can be harvested earlier or later or not harvested at all, depending on a person's circumstances. And that's extremely beneficial and valuable for anyone raising um, animals versus plants. And this is why um, animals are often thought of as a kind of a savings account because they have value and you can um, sell them, you can um, harvest them, um, or you can just keep them just like you can with your own savings account in your bank. And there's also this um, question of the health benefits. So there's research, um, I, I'm sure many of you have read the book, um, Guns, Germs, and Steel, which is a book that I, I think of often and um, quote often. It's such a great book that talks about the world and how it you know changed and why. And there's a lot of discussion in that book about the importance of animals for a variety of reasons. And one of the things it talks about is the fact that um, we all have much greater immunity due to our proximity to domesticated animals. And in fact, he makes the point, uh, Jared Diamond makes the point in Guns, Germs, and Steel that most of the people in, um, in North America, and well, throughout the Americas, that died after Europeans arrived actually died because of germs, not steel, not guns. Um, and it was because they were not living in proximity to animals in the way that the Europeans had been doing. So there were a lot of diseases, most particularly smallpox, but others as well, that the Europeans had a lot of immunity to. And they, um, the people in the new world, uh, you know, quote, in quotes, um, did not um, have that immunity. So we just see through that historical example, how a population can develop um, more immunity by being around animals. And, um, and, and I, in, the, in my book, I go into a lot of um, modern research as well about um, um, asthma and food allergies and all kinds of other things that have been shown to be much lower among people that live in proximity to animals. Um, similarly, because of the fact that you um, don't have to, um, uh, basically animals can live, uh, the grazing animals especially, can live in areas where you can't uh, farm um, it has enabled people to live in many parts of the world where we wouldn't have been able to live, and, it's, and, and it enables people to live in remote rural areas even today. And, um, and then, you know, we're able as a society to produce food from non-farmable land. And I wanted to um, just drill down on that for a little bit um, further. Um, Jessica mentioned um, Professor um, Lynn Hunsinger, and she is the person from whom I first learned that nearly half of the Earth's land surface is non-farmable. And um, this is a critical point because the vast majority of the livestock around the world, not just in the United States, is on that land. And in the United States, it's been estimated that about 80% of cattle grazing is taking place on non-farmable land. So if the cattle were not there, that area simply wouldn't be contributing to the food system. And so all of these discussions about you know, inefficiencies of livestock and stuff just don't make any sense when you think of it like that. Um, and this is a, another really important point that's related but different um, from the Sustainable Food Trust, another UK organization that I really like and admire. Um, they talk about the importance of the food you can produce for human um, sustenance on that same land. So they talk about it as a miraculous conversion. And they have estimated that between 9 to 23 grams of protein per person per day about 20 to 50% of the world's total requirements could be provided by livestock reared on human inedible feeds, with the most important of these being grass, as well as 10% of our energy and iron needs, 20% of our calcium and zinc, and a massive 75% of our vitamin B12 needs. This is a crucial food source if we are to feed a growing population, Sustainable Food Trust points out. So this isn't saying that all of the livestock could do this. They're saying just the grazing animals on the non-farmable land. That's what they're quantifying here. 
This is a really important statistic that I think we should all have in our back pocket. Um, and then what are the sort of overall e ecosystem services from animals? Well, I mentioned Gabe Brown earlier, um, his book, Dirt to Soil, does such a beautiful job of um, talking about the in, how um, animals help soil health and just biodiversity and how um, having diversity on, and on your land is so important. But he talks about very specifically about why animals and how animals help the biology of the soil as well as the other aspects of soil health. And because we have the animals, and this is something obviously that would be near and dear to all of you, um, you're really creating and maintaining grassland through the presence of these gra grazing animals. And um, grasslands that would not continue to exist and certainly not to thrive if you didn't have the, um, the animals on them. And this is not just a, you know, a, a, an ecological question and a food production question. This is really a question about um, the beauty of our landscapes. So you have this pastoral landscape that is created wherever you have the grazing animals, which would simply disappear and does disappear, in fact, where you remove the animals. And as I've um, mentioned several times, you protect the soils by having, um, you know, that vegetative cover and the healthy um, below ground environment, but you also have um, cleaner water. I talk about, you know, again, I talk about this in a lot of detail in my books, but um, you have cleaner water and you have more water contained in the soil where you have this healthy soil and from this impact of the animals. And this is um, all because you are this, you have this um, optimal subterranean environment. So if you think about that picture that I showed a, a few minutes ago um, with all of the life below ground, that whole system that's happening down there is really triggered and um, kept vibrant by uh, the, the, the presence, the impact of the animals. And um, a good example of the biodiversity and wildlife benefits um, are the sort of um, the impacts on the birds and the bees. So I've written about um, both of these issues in various places. And Audubon Society has adopted um, the phrase, what's good for the herd is good for the bird, because they have recognized the incredible importance for the grassland species, which are the most threatened of all types of bird species in North America, um, to maintaining this open ranching land and to working closely with the people um, who are managing ranches and farms. And here's an article that I wrote in 2011 for the Atlantic about um, the importance of um, rangelands for bee populations. And, and this was um, specifically talking about some um, research at UC Berkeley that had actually quantified the amount of contribution that the rangelands were having in terms of the eco economic value of um, the native um, pollinators, the wild pollinators, and how many of them were living basically on ranches. Um, and so just quickly, I want to show um, this picture of underground communities. I showed um, the, the drawing earlier. This is These are actual photographs showing kind of the, the dense um, root network where you have grass and the picture on the right there at the green stuff that's actually um, a photo from you from the department of agriculture um, showing the coating that's on the the uh the roots from the grass species um which is um something that fosters the interactions the glomalin or glomalin depending on how you prefer to pronounce it um is um, fosters the interaction between the plant and the soils. And there's more and more understanding that where you have a healthy soil system, there's a whole very um, intricate process where the plant exchanges, basically gives carbon to the soil and gets the nutrients that it needs from the, from the surrounding soil. And this is all fostered by the glomalin that's coating um, coating those, um, those roots. And all of this, this whole system is um, fostered by healthy grazing practices. And here's a, uh, my friend, um, Seth Itzkan uh, in Vermont uh, has lent me this slide. This is a picture that he took um, in Africa. I believe this is actually in South Africa. And um, it shows that you have the exact same, um, you know, climate conditions on either side of the fence here, but you have different management systems and you actually have carbon and water going into the soil on the left where you have a holistically managed um, grazing operation. And then you have 
um, carbon and water essentially being released in a degrading system where you have, in both cases, they have grazing, but in the one case, they have well-managed um, high density animal grazing. And on the other side, um, they don't. So that's where, you know, it's, it's not the cow, it is the how. And so um, I just wanted to say another word about the food quickly before I close. Um, there's uh, more flavor there's more, um, there's a whole body of research now showing that there are more secondary compounds um, in real foods compared to processed foods. These are things that delight our senses and signal nutrition. So then we actually tap into our inherent nutritional wisdom when we eat foods that satiate and fully nourish us. And these two books, if you haven't read them, I highly recommend them. These are books that talk about this very issue, um, how our bodies are actually hardwired to eat real food and how the processed food industry has attempted to trick our senses to think that we're getting foods that our body wants and needs, but that actually when we eat real food, we actually tend um, to, to recognize and to learn um, what our bodies actually need and require to stay healthy over the long term. And this book on the right nourishment is one of the most important books I've ever read, um, which explains about our inherent nutritional wisdom and how we can, foods like meat and milk and cheese are a really important part of a healthy diet and our bodies recognize these things as incredibly valuable and healthy foods. Dr. Georgia Ede, who's um, a, um, a physician who specializes particularly in this question of um, mental health and physical health and diet and how it's all related. And she actually believes that animals are absolutely essential for long-term health. And she says, plant nutrients, she explains this is because plant nutrients su suffer from low bioavailability, which means they are hard for us to extract, absorb, and utilize. And she gives examples of vitamin A, iron, zinc, and DHA, and EPA, which are all essential nutrients that are much less usable when they come from plant um, compounds instead of from animals. Um, so I just want to close with a few pictures of what I think our food system um, can look like. This is our friend Paul Willis in Iowa, who's um, with together with my husband, Bill Nyman, helped to create the Nyman Ranch Company. And he especially was on the pork side of it, based in Iowa, raising pigs um, outdoors. Um, this is an, up, an upstate New York um, outdoor chicken operation. And this is Bill um, from a few years ago uh, on our own ranch, as you all know. When, usually when I um, show this slide elsewhere in the world, I have to explain that we have a dry season here. <laughs> I don't have to tell any of you about that. So you understand what you're looking at. And this is a picture of me during the not dry season, as we know, uh, with one of our calves. And these are some of our heritage turkeys um, on our ranch. And in conclusion, I just want to say again, it is not the cow, it is the how. So I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you and look forward to whatever questions you may have. Thank you, Nicolette. That was wonderful. Uh, your presentation in the book as well. As we mentioned earlier, it's you know, we all read it here on staff and are really, really impressed and learned a lot from that. Uh, since this is the CEO speaker series, I am going to pull that card and ask the first question. Sure. Uh, since you wrote the original uh, Defending Beef book, you've since written a, an update to that. What has changed since the first book, if anything, to the second and how you are able to defend beef or some of your arguments that may have changed since then? Yes. Well, thank you for asking that. That is... Um... I actually wrote the first book. I think I was a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of like understanding the need for it. Um, so I wrote it um, in, quite a few years ago and I felt you know more and more that there was more and more discussion about beef and why it's problematic, supposedly. You know, bad for our health, bad for the environment, especially for climate. And what happened was after I wrote the first book, I did a lot of speaking about it and um, did a lot of you know interviews with the media. But um, but as time passed, I felt there was more discussion, actually, but the book was, you know, the data was not being updated and so forth. And there was a ton of additional research, like all this methane stuff that I was talking about today. Um, a lot of that research has just been done in the last several years. So um, I wanted uh, to make it uh, contain the current research 
and also reflect my current thinking, which is much more to focus on this question of industrialization and industrial and processed foods versus just, um, I did it, I was a little bit more um, sort of, um, I had a little bit more dichotomous like um, plant versus animal kind of thing in the original version. And in the new version, I, I focused much more on this question of real foods from um, complex systems that really mirror nature. Because I think that is so much the key to healthy agricultural systems and to healthy human bodies. So I, I got to shift. Um, I told the, the publisher asked me to, invited me to um, redo the book. And I said, oh, I can, I'd love to, and I can probably do it in three months. And then after I'd been working on it for a few weeks, I called them up and said, I need a year. <laughs> and that's what it took me. So, cause it was a lot of work. So, cause I did, I, I reevaluated every paragraph and every sentence. So, um, so I'm, I'm very happy with the current version. I still love the original book, but it, it's the current version um, much more closely reflects my current thinking and has a lot more of the current research, which is there's a lot more out there now, not just about methane, but about soil carbon sequestration and on the health side, um, the, the incredible importance of meat and other animal-based foods for human health. There's a lot more on that now too. So I was happy to be able to put that in the book as well. Nicolette, um, we've had a, a handful or a bunch of questions that kind of all are around the same sort of thing, which is um, the challenges, the hurdles um, of converting to regenerative ag. I think we have a lot of ranchers on the on on, on the call tonight who who have seen the the challenges posed by by the conversion cost, change in how we've always done it, that type of thing, and. So a, a number of people are asking, can you talk about the hurdles? Can you talk about how you've seen uh, successes in conversion, maybe from your own perspective? And then uh, there's also a question on what, what else can, can we as the voting public or we as California Rangeland Trust do to uh, encourage slash support uh, the change to regenerative ag? Yeah, well, those are um, really obviously Excellent questions and very pertinent. Um, you know, what I've tried to do is, I mean, first of all, I think we probably all know those, everybody that's involved directly in agriculture knows that um, you sit around your dinner table like every day discussing what you're doing on your farm and ranch. And you, and I know my husband and I are often, we have different ideas about what should be done or shouldn't be done. And so we kind of debate and discuss things, you know, should, should we be doing this? Should we not be doing this? And we're kind of constantly tweaking and trying new things and just trying to move in a better direction all the time. It's, it's not at all static, you know, and I know that that's probably the, you know, that wouldn't necessarily be the case for every agricultural operation in the country, but I would bet you that everybody on this call is functioning basically like that. Um, uh, because people who are really thinking about these issues and trying to improve systems are functioning like that. So, you know, I think um, a few ideas, I, would, I obviously don't have all the answers on this at all, but um, I think um, one thing, I, I really like Gabe Brown's advice, which is he's always um, encouraging experimentation and creativity and being willing to fail. <laughs> you know, obviously you can't have a wholesale failure because your financial, you know, health may completely depend on that and may may cause tremendous problems, but being um being able within, you know, your means um to continue to try new things and to explore new ideas and to experiment um I think is really important and recognizing that um not all of these things are going to succeed. And um, so I think those ideas are really important. And, um, you know, I we haven't like on our ranch, for example, we have not tapped into any of these um, programs that are out there to help um, in, um, farmers and ranchers to increase the amount of carbon that they're getting in their soil. But there are um, I would like to. I mean, I haven't done it. I don't have an ideological opposition to doing that. And I would like to try um, to see if we can at some point um, take advantage of some of those programs. But I think there are more and more 
you know, again, I'm sure this is a very educated group of people. So I'm sure people have already taken lots of classes and seminars and read books and stuff. But I think just continuing to try to learn more and to try to see what other people are doing and to try to visit other farms and ranches and see what they're doing and to just to share information and to see, and then that willingness to experiment and to be um, prepared to fail. You know, I mean, again, hopefully not a total failure, you know, in terms of your whole operation, but you know, that different things that you're going to try are not necessarily going to work. And um, so that flexibility and that willingness to try new things, I think are key, key part of the mindset. So, um, and the other thing is, I think, again, everybody um, who's on this call undoubtedly already knows this, but um, something I'm communicating all the time when I'm talking to people is that um, I think uh, every ranch is really different. And so, and one thing that I've learned, you know, that I really didn't understand at all before I moved here and was actually living on a ranch as I have been for the last 19 years, is that it's not just that, you know, our, our ranch isn't like, you know, a ranch in Oklahoma. It's that our ranch isn't even like a ranch up the road and even in parts of our ranch they're quite different than other parts of our ranch you know so um really learning that place and understanding it and actually i wrote um the forward for a wonderful book called the call of the reed warbler by um an australian uh sheep farmer and philosopher charles massey um who's also a wonderful human being that i've had a chance to get to know over the years he 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 writes about um this whole idea of understanding the land and understanding its function and really trying to learn what your land is, you know, sort of naturally designed to be doing and try to understand that natural landscape function and to try to make your own operation as in sync as possible with that natural function, not just as an altruistic act, but because you are going to be more resilient and successful if you understand that. So those are just some ideas. Those are not, none of those things are really like necessarily like you know, great solutions to anything. But those are some thoughts that I have about this difficult topic. Okay, Nicolette, I've got a question for you. Um, uh, I grew up uh, uh, in an era when uh, ranchers believed that uh, environmentalists and university researchers were kind of the enemy. You had to really protect your ranch from um, intruders who um, might uh, try to use the existence of uh, endangered species or native grasses or other things to take away your rights to uh, do agriculture and ranch and, and, and graze and ranch the land. Um, now that we know that it's not the cow, it's the how, and that uh, university research proves um, that uh, good rangeland grazing um, is actually good for the environment, sinks carbon and all the things that you uh, uh, talked about in your presentation. In your experience um, researching all of this, do you think the cattle ranching industry is shifting and adapting fast enough? Are we, are we um, yeah, I guess, are we adapting fast enough to help save the world through cows? Well, if not, um, what should we be doing in order to adapt? Yeah, so it's like it's it's very interesting because um, visiting with a lot of places and a lot of people around the world, I encounter very different mindsets. You know, um, there are on the one hand, I think there are more people than ever in agriculture that are really interested in trying to learn how to improve what they're doing. You know, there's this um, very large and growing recognition that we can do better, and that by learning more and by experimenting and you know being flexible as we were just talking about and really learning your own land um you can dramatically improve how much water you keep on your land how much soil health you have how much diversity of vegetation you have how much vegetation you have and ultimately how healthy your animals are those things can be dramatically affected by your management and i think more people are recognizing that and um you know dr alan williams always says he used to give talks you know to five or ten people and now he gives talks to hundreds you know because there's just more and more um 
interest in knowing like, well, what can I do? And the recognition that you can change pretty dramatically what you're doing and the impact that that has. So that on the one hand, there's this pretty large um, body of people within um, within branching and farming that I think are interested and are learning and are um, adapting. On the other hand, there's still a pretty large chunk of people and companies that are essentially ignoring the need to try to adapt and change. And, um, you know, I talk about the sort of tone deafness in defend in defending beef, that the beef industry has historically just had this um, response of, you know, those people don't know what they're talking about, you know, they're city dwellers that and I kind of <laughs> I sort of agree. Like, yes, there are a lot of criticisms coming from the city folk that don't make any sense. But on the other hand, there's a lot of legitimacy in a lot of the concerns that have been raised, you know, whether it's animal welfare or, or you know, water health or soil erosion or whatever. Um, so, you know, like I've always tried to be a bridge between the communities and all my writing and work is to try to um, interface with both and to, um, you know, I gave a series of talks to Virginia farmers um, a couple of months ago and, you um, and every single person there was a, a, a person who makes their living from farming. And uh, and quite a few of the people were um, in that mindset of like, you know, if you're an environmentalist, you're not allowed to come onto my property. And first of all, environmentalist is a dirty word right there. Um, so um, it was kind of um, challenging to, to interface with that group, but also really exciting and rewarding for me because I got to present a bunch of ideas that a lot of them hadn't really heard before or didn't really believe until maybe maybe I hopefully affected some of their mindset on some of these things. But I think um, it is a challenge. You know, we we don't have that much time. We know that the health of the planet is 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 in, you know, there's a lot of serious problems that are happening and climate change is just the biggest one, but there are lots of them. Water, you know, scarcity and um, soil degradation and desertification the world over, you know. But there's um, very exciting, I think, um, examples of you know how to how to address it and how to repair it and how to improve it. And um, so I think you know um, it's just a, a challenge for all of us to to try to um, do our best on our own place, but also to help spread the word and you know share the gospel and get more and more people aware of um, these kinds of books that we're, we've been talking about and the, you know, these kinds of webinars and, you know, just get more people engaged in this whole process of how do we improve what we're doing and um, um, listen to the legitimacy of the criticisms and then, you know, um, figure out what works best for us, you know, on our own piece of land. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna follow up on that. Um, that's one of the things I find um, the most valuable and profound about your work is that you straddle, um, you know, both worlds. You can understand perspectives of you know environmental attorneys like you started out as and a vegetarian for three decades. Um, so my follow up question is: is um, is there one phrase or one one minute conversation you could have with your former self? Um, one thing you could say to your former self that would have uh, stopped you in your tracks and made you think about like what you believed back then. Um, and the reason I ask this is that uh, us as ranchers uh, encounter every day people who think that we're ruining the world and causing the, you know, the apocalypse and that we're, we're terrible people and that's a lot of guilt to deal with and we know that that's not true or we're on a journey of knowing that that's not true, but how do we say in one sentence, you know, yeah, um, it's impossible. <laughs> I have that t-shirt that I had in that last slide. It's not the cow, it's the how. And I just, I, I cannot say enough how I help, how helpful that has been for me because, um, you know, I like to tell people whether it's a carrot, you know, or it's a strawberry or it's beef, um, how it's being produced is everything in terms of the helpfulness of the food that's being produced and the impact on land, water, and wildlife, you know, and so if you just kind of like, I think that's like the super short elevator speech for me. And I think it's, um, you know, it's cracks open a little bit, this idea that people are really closed on something. And then you just kind of say, well, okay, I understand the concerns you're raising. Um, but this is what I've seen. It's anything can be done well or done badly and cattle. And the other thing, of course, I always like to say is that 
um, is to remind people about the value of um, animal-based foods for human health because and nutrition, because um, we know that the world has a pretty dramatic shortage of um, not just protein, but a lot of nutrients. And the food that comes from animals is one of the best sources of so much. And so when we, you know, talk about replacing that with plant-based, you know, laboratory creations. Um, to me, you know, real food with real nourishment is a key component of creating a healthy planet. Thank you so much. Steve, I think there's- I, know, I got it. <laughs> um, I'm sure we could ask questions all night, but I do want to be, respectful of people's time. Is there, are there any other questions that any of our folks have for Nicolette? I see that Angelo asked a question. He said, uh, what are some of the major hurdles you see with being able to transform our food systems to more regenerative models at scale? And that's a great question. Um, at scale is the tricky part. Well, um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with my husband, Bill Nyman's work. Um, he, that's always been what he's been passionate about. He's not interested in just, you know, um, producing, not that there's anything wrong with doing this, but for him, <laughs> he doesn't want to just raise a few animals to feed our family or a couple of neighbors. He's really interested in, you know, um, system-wide change. And I have to say, I, I share that same passion. So I think um, to me, you know, this idea that one thing I like to refute over and over again is this notion that well-raised food is just for the elite. You know, I think really that everyone has a right to real food, to good food, and that um, it's actually a kind of something that we have to stop thinking that it's okay for people to be eating junk food and that that's that's fine for our school lunches or whatever else you know um and um to me thinking about ways that we can make this financially viable for um the farmer and rancher and thinking of ways that we can make this affordable for the consumer are key parts of this whole dialogue and um you know in both in all three of my books actually i talk about um you know for example affordability of well-raised food and i know like with meat you know um my husband is really good at talking about this he used to um when he first started the Nyman Ranch Company, he actually did all of the butchering himself. <laughs> and then he had a couple other people helping him. And then he ultimately, you know, stopped doing it himself and had um, other people doing it full time. But he really understands every cut of the animal. And I think um, just getting people thinking more and understanding more the value of um, all different parts of the animal and cooking simple, simple preparations. And actually, um, I had a very interesting thing that happened. Um, on that very same tour I was mentioning before when I was in Virginia speaking in um, five different cities to Virginia farmers, or actually they were not cities, they were small towns, <laughs> but parts of Virginia where I was meeting with farmers. Um, there was a large gathering at one of those, it must have been 200 people or so, and almost all of them were farmers, and almost all of them raised cattle. And, uh, and I asked them, I started talking about food and affordability. Somebody asked a question about affordability and I started talking about it. And I said, I said, oh, well, for example, for me, one of my favorite things is beef cheeks, you know, and I kind of saw some quizzical looks and I thought, oh, maybe they don't really, a lot of them might not know that much about beef cheeks. So I said, I said, you know, beef cheeks are so delicious and they're so easy to prepare. And then I said, just out of curiosity, how many of you have had beef cheeks? And I thought it'd be like, you know, two thirds of the audience or something. And it was zero. <laughs> These are people who raise cattle. Okay. And none of them had ever eaten beef cheeks. Well, that was bizarre to me because it's like these are the animals that you yourself are raising and you don't know how to cook one of the most wonderful parts of that animal that was weird that was a weird moment for me and that's when i realized it isn't just the city folk that are disconnected right from you know whole animal eating and really understanding how to cook um inexpensive but beautiful and wonderful and nourishing food from um, the lots of different parts of the animal that we often don't see at the grocery store. And it was actually kind of funny because a woman then um, 
she was a little bit hostile to my message, you know, and she kind of raised her hand. She said, well, we can't, what, we can't get beef cheeks here, which I thought was again, kind of odd. Cause like, you know, you didn't ask this letter house for, you know, the stuff back that you want, you know, but whatever. Then a guy comes up to me right after my talk. And he said, I just Googled it and it's available at Walmart right here in that town, you know, where I was. So I was like, <laughs> well, actually wrong. <laughs> it is widely available if it's available at Walmart. But anyway, the point is, you know, we all have, um, um, blind spots and things that we, um, you know, we've, we've, we've lost a lot of knowledge about food and health and nutrition and agriculture. And I think that, um, you know, I'm very in favor of moving forward, but I'm also very in favor of trying to recapture some of that wisdom that we had, like how to cook, um, lots of different, um, simple, beautiful foods from cuts of the animal that we're not currently using, but they're very affordable. I mean, we, I say we, the average American, there are people in the United States that eat beef cheeks all the time. And I happen to be one of them, actually. So. Well, Nicola, um, the, the issue of food security and, or insecurity, the availability in, in, a, in a local food supply. And as we mentioned before, without the land, there are no cattle. And I think that part of your message really ties into the work that we do with the, range, the Rangeland Trust is protecting for these working lands, these grasslands forever. So that those habitat, that open space and that land and that grass that's, you go from grass to ground beef or it's just an amazing transformation. And so the work that, that, that you have, have done with these books and telling those messages really ties in so strongly to the work we're doing here. And we wanna thank you for being here tonight and that fascinating discussion that again, it is so closely aligned with our work. Thank you. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. It's a real pleasure to have had this opportunity to speak with you. And um, I, you know, I welcome the uh, continued dialogue and I support your work completely. And I wish you all the best in what you're doing. Well, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Nicolette. And before everybody signs off, I just I have to do my job as the fundraiser and remind you that if, if you'd like to make a gift to support the work we're doing, uh, you can visit rangelandtrust.org and click on the donate button. Uh, as Michael said earlier, every gift that we receive, every donation, no matter the size, helps us to conserve California's working ranches. And uh, that was www.rangelandtrust.org. But if you forget, we'll send you a, a, a follow-up email. Uh, if you want to rewatch this presentation or there are friends of yours who missed it, uh, we will be posting it on our YouTube channel probably early next week. Uh, and you can search for California Rangeland Trust on YouTube. Uh, we have our own channel and uh, this will be posted up there. And then finally, for all of you, I want to let you all know that um, we uh, will be celebrating our 25th anniversary next year. 2023 celebrates the 25th anniversary of Rangeland Trust. And we're going to be holding our annual Western Affair on May 20th at Scott and Karen Stone's Yolo Land and Cattle Company near Winters. Um, so mark your calendars for May 20th. We hope everybody who's here tonight will be there on May 20th as well. And uh, we'll be getting out more information on, on table and ticket sales soon. So uh, with that said, again, Nicolette, thank you for a wonderful discussion. Um, as Michael said, I think we both exist to defend beef. And so it's been a really wonderful evening and we can't thank you enough. And with that, we will let you all get back to your evenings. <laughs>